Very good. It's nice to hear from people in love. Um, there's a scripture in Romans 12, verse 9. Let's go there in Romans 12, verse 9. It says, your love must be real. It's from the Apostle Paul to the Christians in Rome. So it must be, you know, why will he write that? It must be that people don't really understand what love is. They don't fully know what, you know, where it is from. And um, the reason why I read is because I've been in the ministry for like 29 years now. Boy, we're getting old. <laughs> and um, in many counselings with people, especially if the ones that are most challenging is when people break up. You know, in relationship, husband and wife. And some of the things I heard, for example, uh, I hear people saying, I want to be separated or divorced because I don't love her anymore. Or I don't love him anymore. And so I asked them, uh, why do you say that? What do you mean by I don't love her anymore? And most of the time they would say, I don't feel love for her or him anymore. I don't have the same feelings anymore. And so then I explained to them what love is. Because love, as we know, when we look at the biblical definition, love is not feeling alone. When just the word love, when we look at the dictionary, you know, here love is also a verb. It is an action verb. It is something, and we know when, when, when love is mentioned here, it's something that you give, right? Love is something that you offer. I mean, we see a lot of scriptures, and of course, the perfect example of what true love is, is the love of God. That's the only one that is real. It is real. Anything that's connected with God, that is of God, is real. It is permanent. Feelings, they come and go. And we cannot rely on, on feelings alone. And so people stumble, and so I explained that, you know, love is not just feeling, it's something more. Well, there's a song that says, love is a many splendor thing, right? It's, it's more than just one definition, it's, I mean, we, he was reading a while ago, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in love is patient, love is kind, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot more to it. And it's almost like love is the trunk of the tree, and from the tree there's different branches and twigs, and expressing itself in different ways. Love, the love of God. Uh, one of the expressions of love that I would like to uh, focus today is that of, uh, we were saying a while ago, love never fails. Love is being committed. It's a commitment. That's what love is. Being committed never fails. Imagine if love fails. If the love of God fails, that's very dangerous. You know, the thing that we have joy and assurance is because we know the love of God never fails. It is constant and God is committed to us. That's, that's the love of God. And we know that, we know that very well. Uh, there's a story of a person who was a president of a university. This story explains what commitment and love is. Uh, very popular in the university, uh, good leader, wealthy man. For many years he served uh, the university. Uh, one point in time, his wife had developed Alzheimer's. You know what Alzheimer's is, right? <laughs> and then after months, the Alzheimer's condition became worse. She started becoming more and more forgetful. And the time came when she doesn't even recognize the husband. So the man made a decision. He went and called his board and announced that he is going to retire so that he can serve and take care of his wife. And of course they were shocked and they were trying their best to change his mind because he was very needed as president in the university. He was needed and they don't want him to retire. And one of the board members stood up and said, we don't understand, you know, we need you here in this university. Why will you retire and take care of her? Don't you know that she doesn't even recognize you? She doesn't even know you. Why don't you just hire somebody else? 
And then he said, uh, I know, 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago, I made a commitment to my wife to love her. And I know that uh, she doesn't recognize me anymore. But I know her. She's my wife. Now that's, that's commitment. But even at that situation, this man was committed to loving the wife. That's commitment, even to the most difficult time. Now for us, you know, if we look back, you know, you people who are married or you people who are about to get married or planning to be married, you know how it is? It is easy when you think about commitment. Commitment is easy when, I remember when you were young, you're dating somebody beautiful or perfect in beauty, right? Nice clothes, uh, smells good. You know, you're dating her or maybe you're dating him. He looks macho or sports-like and good leadership. You know what I mean? Funny. I mean, at those times, it's easy to make a commitment. In fact, when I officiate a wedding, when we ask that question about commitment, they can't wait to say, I do! You know, because who would not want to commit to a person that they would really love and a person who's beautiful and handsome and promising and good looking? But then as time and years pass, right? As time years pass, things begin to change and you begin to realize that this person that you married, now you have to pick up his smelly socks on the floor you have to do his dirty laundry, right? It's different times. And uh, then commitment, that is real commitment. That's when it's tested. Or perhaps, uh, you know, you married her, she's so beautiful and nice clothes and smells good, you know, Chanel number no. five or whatever it is. But now she doesn't wear Chanel number no. five. She wears Bengay or Tiger Balm <laughs> or Salompas or you know, <laughs> smell. You wake up in the morning in bed and you look at her and say, Who is she? Right, you don't recognize. <laughs> commitment changes. I mean, these are just some examples, but people's commitment are tested when those things happen. But love never fails. That's, that's the point we're trying to emphasize here. <coughs> love is commitment. That's, that's what it is. And uh, so we learn from, we learn so much that love is more than just like a feeling. Of course, feeling is a part of it. It's maybe an expression of that. But how do we express love? How is it expressed to people? Now, good thing in the scripture here, there's one particular book that is so helpful. Uh, it's called the Song of Songs. You heard of the Song of Solomon, right? We rarely use that. It's basically eight chapters. And there's this woman, and there's the husband, and wife and husband, they have dialogue. They talk to each other, and then there's the audience that observes and also gives their comments. So it's a nice book, Song of Songs, written by most likely uh, Solomon. But in this book, it, it shows and expresses how this man really, really loves this, the wife. How this man really, really loves the wife. Let's go to uh, this uh, book. Solomon, um, he was the wisest man that ever lived, but not really wise, as you know his story. But at least in, in this book, he was showing to us a model, a good example. Um, actually, it's a metaphor, it's an example for the relationship between the church and Jesus Christ, right? Now, in Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 8, chapter 1, verse 8. Let's go there in Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 8. Let me go there myself. It's right after, uh, for you if you brought your Bible, Ecclesiastes 1, I mean Ecclesiastes and then Song of Solomon, 1, verse 8. The first sentence in this dialogue or conversation of the man, you know, is in verse 8. The man speaks to the woman and he said, you are the most beautiful of women. Meaning he was comparing his wife, you know, to other women. And he says, you are most beautiful. It's a, it's a love story. It's a love story here of this man 
that the first thing, the first thing he does when he wakes up in the morning is to tell and, and appreciate and give his wife a compliment or praise to her, speaking a blessing over his wife. I mean, this is really important because these eight chapters and the man in this book 40 times praised the wife. And I'm saying this because love never fails. And it is so easy for people as they go on through the years, you know, familiarity breeds contempt, as they say, and they forget, forgetting this. Now, the principle applies not only with husband and wife, but also with our children. How we get so familiar with relationship, we joke around and so forth, but, but love, because we're people, love should be expressed by words, by complimenting, as in this case. Complimenting. And in my own experience in counseling, I've encountered a situation where some people have not received compliment. You know, when was the last time you received some compliment from somebody else? Some people go through months and years without a compliment, a praise, a good <coughs> word from somebody. Here, the man says, you are the most beautiful. Now, in, in chapter 2, verse 2, again, he, the, the man speaks again here. Among the young women, my darling, is like a lily among the thorns. So, it's, it's, it's a hyperbole. It's comparing the wife with others out there. There's many beautiful people out there. They're like thorns. And you're the flower. And it's... So, so, you know, if you haven't read this, it's pretty good, but we have to be careful though. I mean, there are times when, when the man would say to the woman, your neck is like the Tower of David. Now, don't take that literally, because she might get upset, you know. Uh, the way they describe, of course, is the man who's saying that you, you're awesome, you're stable, you have the strength, you, you have the confidence, you know, like the Tower of David, you know, using this, this description. And when we do that, just imagine, imagine what happens to all our relationships if this is the type of conversation we have at home among our husbands and wives, parents and children, more focus on, on the praising and, and the complimenting. And I know we all go through challenges in life and difficulties, you know, life's problems, but when we have this conversation, when we are focused on this, then it becomes easier to go through tough times. So husbands, think about yourself. When was the last time you told your wife, you are beautiful. I really appreciate being your husband. I look forward to getting old with you. You're so kind. You know, all the good things we can, because this is love. Love is expressed. Love is not just enacted, but spoken and expressed. But I know some guy would say, ah, I'm not that kind of guy. You know, I don't like kind of a feely, gooey, kind of warm and fuzzy. You know, I'm, I'm a macho type guy. You know, and if I do that, my friends are going to laugh at me. You know, I'm a macho guy. Well, your friends say that of you. They think you're weak. You change your friends. Those are not good friends. <laughs> because a real man is one who would give praises to the wife, to the children. A real man is one who would open the car door to the wife, for the wife. A real man is one who's willing to throw garbage and, and do things and serve. That's a real man. A real man is, is one who will keep his family together. You know, the word husband is an old English word, husband. It's really a combination of two words. Hus is like from the word house, house, band. Now, of course, you know, band, probably the best thing to understand, band is rubber band. You know, when you want to tie things together, you have a rubber band, right? It's to keep things together, you use a rubber band. So, as husbands, that's our job. We are the keeper of the family. We are the keeper of the house. We make sure that we keep the house and the family and the marriage together. We are the house band. We make sure that that is not broken, but that is kept together as husbands. That's our job. 
And uh, that's why, you know, it's so clear here from a biblical perspective. In this marriage relationship between husband and wife, and of course here in Song of Solomon, picturing the church and Jesus Christ, it shows how free-flowing love is, how it is expressed. So it's a biblical model that we can follow and, and embrace. The same thing that goes on here, the woman speaks and the man speaks and so forth. See, when we, when, it's, when we speak blessings to somebody else, when we speak positive good things, we draw out the positives. But when we speak the negatives, oftentimes what comes out is also the negative. So we draw out the good when we say the good. When we treat our wives like our queen, and most likely they will return and treat us as kings. Now I like that. <laughs> right, guys? <laughs> but it's so easy to forget. You know, I, I, I go out with my friends, high school friends, and sometimes I, I feel badly when we, we go out and we go biking, and then it's time, it's afternoon, you know, one of the friends say, oh, I guess it's time for me to go back to the old woman. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just a joke for them or whatever. And... Um, that is, has become the habit. And then I just say, oh, okay, I think it's about time for me to go back to Queen Carmelita. You know, it's my wife. <laughs> I'll just joke around with them. Because truly that's how our wives are. She is the queen in the house. And when we treat that, and our young children, our kids see that kind of relationship, and it affects them. Oftentimes, how we treat, you know, how the husband treats the wife, the son learns that, and then when they become husbands themselves, that's most likely how they will treat their wives. And so as, as a mother, you know, father, if you want to have your daughter to treat and have a good marriage, have a good marriage. I mean, the best gift, one of the best gifts that we can give our children is to give them happily married parents. That's the best gift we can give. Now, I know I realize that in this world, it's not always uh, ideal. You know, there are people in this world who, who are single moms, single parents, and, and we cry you know, for you. And Jesus Christ offers himself as one who is the husband. And I just salute all of those who struggle with that. Um, but that's the scripture. And if you are married, this is that, that important for us to follow this the biblical example. So love is expressed, you know, in this way. So we express it, you know. Love is powerful. What's that scripture? It says, perfect love casts out fear. Uh, I remember the time when, you know, I was in the Philippines. I told this story years ago, but I like to tell it again because it look, makes me look courageous. <laughs> anyway, I was in the house, you know, in the house, and my wife was in the garden. And I know she was either playing with the kids or cleaning up, whatever, I forgot. But as I was in the house, I heard my wife shout, Snake! Snake! By the way, I hate snakes. <laughs> I hate reptiles. I mean, I don't like, you know, at SCP, you know, summer camp, you have this, you know, kids go there and have the snakes all around them and play with all the reptiles. And I go there very close, but I don't want to touch them, you know. But anyways... She was shouting, snake, snake, and snake. And of course, being the father, what do you do? Being the husband, right? Perfect love casts out fear. Well, not really, but at that time, you, 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 you had to think about it. So, she said, snake, snake, and I opened my chest like this. I didn't see a letter S, so I just said, uh, <laughs> that one too, I don't have the S, so love will do, right? So I ran. But before I ran, I got a kitchen knife. And as soon as I went out, then I saw my wife standing kind of still. And right in front of her was a snake. But this snake kind of stood up. This, the kind of snake where they do this, expand. You know? It's a cobra. I mean, we, in the Philippines, we didn't used to have cobras. But somehow, recently, there are, I don't know what happened, but somehow there are now cobras in the area. So I saw this cobra, um, you know. So she was kind of frozen. And I hate snakes. I mean, you hate snakes, right? 
But you have no choice. Perfect love casts out fear. That's what love does. It's not only spoken. So I went there quickly, right between her and the snake, and cut the snake's head off. <laughs> See, it makes me look courageous. Um, of course, the snake is only one foot long, but anyway. <laughs> that still takes a lot of courage. You know? That's a snake. It's still poisonous. You know? It's still painful. <laughs> but that's what it does. You, you do something because because of love, whatever struggle, maybe, you know, that's a true story, but in life, in marriage, there are many snakes that happen. There are many other challenges, in, challenges that will come to you and make life difficult. But because of love, love conquers fear. You go and step out and do it. That's, that's I feel, love has expressed. We have to express it. Not only by action, but also by words. Compliment. I urge us in this congregation, let us learn to give good words to people. It's powerful. I know when I was at SCP, I heard different testimonials. Anthony Mullins and Greg Williams. These are now leaders in the church administration. And all of them gave this testimony that the reason why they are now in that position is because when they were young once, maybe playing basketball or at SCP, some older gentleman or you know, leader in church come by their side and says, you're good. I can see a leader in you. When people drop those good words in the, in the hearts and minds of those young people, they rise to that level and they become good. So words are powerful and so we have to say them. They are. When we treat somebody like they're capable or we treat our wives as queen, they rise to that level. So we express it. There's power in the love. In fact, everything that Jesus Christ did, when Jesus Christ saw these people, he had compassion on them. The ministry of Jesus, the things that he did, when he preached, all of those is motivated by love. Somehow ministry, somehow healing, somehow all those good things that is done, whether it's service, everything is done better and more effectively when it is moved and is motivated by love. So I ask myself that question too as a Christian. Am I motivated by love? You know, by the things that I do, is it by love? Compliment. You know? uh, although there was one time when uh, my wife and I were newly married, newly married. There are times when you don't have to say anything, I'm pointing out. We were newly married and uh, of course I came from the province of Pampanga, you're from the Philippines, know that. And in Pampanga we like to cook, you know, guys cook in Pampanga. We like food, that's why we like to cook. That's why. <laughs> so, um, but anyways, I came home, I was a young pastoral intern and my wife told me that she cooked me this chicken adobo. Oh, I was so hungry and I was looking forward to coming back home, you know. And there was my wife, probably we were just a few days married. Right? I came home and, and then she welcomed me with a great smile and she said, I cook your favorite chicken adobo. And so I, I was so happy and, and then she, she opened this big pot. And when she opened it like this, it looked like sinigang <laughs> soup, you know what I mean? You know, if you're not Filipino, it's chicken adobo is more like dry, kind of with gravy in there, you know. And I saw it, it's, there's water in it. And the chicken is floating. It was my first time to eat chicken adobo soup. You know, it's like somebody said spaghetti soup or whatever, right? Um, but at least now she tells me that uh, I'm so glad she says, at that particular time, you didn't correct me. You know, you didn't say anything. Because sometimes that I hear from wives, they say, all I hear from my husband is complain. Why does this dinner taste like this? Why is it this? Why is that? You know, instead of good things. You know, we, we, we can get so familiar with our relationship with people and forget the basic good things in life and, and just praise, you know, just praise, praise people. So this, in, in this, you know, song of song, we see, I don't have to go through all of this story here. But we see this lovely conversation between between a husband and, and wife here. Uh, that's, how, that's how we see it. And uh, let's focus on our wives and treat them as queen.
Too many women today feel beaten down, feeling depressed, lonely, insecure, low self-esteem, all because the husband is not giving them what God expects and requires of him as a husband. The Bible says the wife is the reflection of the man's glory. And if my wife comes here in church looking beaten and, and depressed and down, then she's a reflection of me. That's how I treat her. And that's not good. I should ask myself, am I treating my wife well? Am I making my wife secure? Does my wife or my husband know that I am proud of her? Do I think she is the best? Men on a regular basis, gentlemen on a regular basis, just look at your wife and see how she reflects you. Your wife should be strong and confident, secure, beautiful, radiant, happy, healthy. And you should see that in her smile and the way she appears and she carries herself. That's how it should be done. I mean, it's amazing here in the scripture. That's exactly what's happening here. I can just go through all of these eight chapters, but it's a beautiful conversation between husband and wife. The scripture tells us that Solomon here, the husband, blessed his wife. And when he blessed his wife, the children rose up and blessed her as well. The children will treat the mother almost the same as how they see the father treats the mother or the wife. They reflect that too. We are setting an example. As I mentioned, the best gift we give our children is to give them a loving married life, you know, father and uh, mother. And that's, that's important. So we men, you know, come back to chivalry, come back to being gentle. Open the car door of your wife. Prepare coffee or tea in the morning. Go out of your way and give her the respect. I heard someone said one time, if a man ever opens a car door for his wife, either he's got a new car or a new wife. <laughs> That's not good. You know, if you only do that when you have a new car because you like the feeling of a new car door or something. We need to go back to biblical values of respect and honor. As I said, you know, you might say, you know, well, you don't understand, Herbie. My wife is an argumentative, she nags and all of this. You know, oftentimes it's that way because in the first place you don't treat her well. Husbands, you know, you forget that. You don't. So a real man, you know, when people say that you're a weak man because you do this for your wife, those are not good friends. A real man is one who will open the door for his wife. A real man is one who will take care of the children. A real man is one who would be willing to serve and do household chores. You know, C.S. Lewis one time said, I don't know, but it seems easier to pray for my wife than wash the dishes. <laughs> That's C.S. Lewis. I know it's probably it's the real thing, but it's, it's true. But then you have to really think, well, if you really love her, your wife, then you do that. But there's one thing here that uh, before we close, in, let's go to a scripture in uh, Ephesians 5. Because as much as we try to do all those things, we need to understand that we are Christians. And Christian marriage is different from the others. The reason why we call it a Christian marriage is because we have the presence of Jesus. And all the mustering and all the trying hard of trying to please the wife without God, without Jesus, Present in a relationship, it fails. Notice in Ephesians 5 verse 25. Our marriage relationship is to reflect the love between Christ and the church. Here in the Song of Solomon, that's what it, what it is. The same love and commitment and kindness and forgiveness that is between the church and Christ, that should be what it is in the family. We read in Ephesians 5, 25 to 32, Husbands, husbands, love your wives. 
It's a command. It's a verb, an action verb, meaning it is expressed. It is something that you, you have to do. Love your wives. It is something that you give. Love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. That's what love is. It defines here. Love is giving yourself. Love is dying for somebody, sacrificing. It's almost like, you know, I was reading this. It's almost like, it feels like Jesus loved the church more than he loves himself. Because he died for the church. I mean, that's how, from my, you know, thinking, that seems to be what it is. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Jesus Christ treats the church as like a queen, special. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Whoa! Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Now, think about that, men. He who loves his wife loves himself. That's why my motto in uh, my married life here is happy wife, happy life. <laughs> I have come to a decision with my wife because in my experience as pastor, most of those who want to separate, you know, separate from a relationship, most of their complaint is this. I'm loving him more than what I, than he loving me. I, I'm giving more here and I notice that I'm not getting as much as I'm trying to give. You know, that's, I don't get fulfilled because I got married, I thought I would be so loved, but why is it that I'm loving more and I don't get as much as I give? That's mostly, but that's not love. I mean, that's not what it is. Love is not about getting more. You, you know that, right? You agree. It's not about trying to measure up, okay, I, I, I got 20 points and, uh, you know, you give, you know, I gave 30 points and I get only 20, so I want to get out of this. It says here, well, let's read it again. It says, he who loves his wife loves himself. So, my wife and I had this understanding years ago, and that is, uh, our motto was, even from the beginning, in, in addition to happy wife, happy life, that's mine, right? Is, outgive each other. We have come to a decision that, when we have come to a point that I am loving her more, I mean, at least from my perspective, that makes me happy. When I come to a point that I am giving more, that is my joy, because I'm giving more. And the same thing with her. When she thinks that she's giving more, then that makes her happy. It's not the other way around. Because when you have this idea that I will be happy if I get more, that is selfish. That's selfish. You see, in the economy of the kingdom of God or in the accounting of the kingdom of God, things are different. The Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. The Bible says, he who exalts himself will be abased, right? There's so many principles in the Bible that is contrary to the accounting of man. So here in this relationship, because Jesus is in the marriage, my marriage with my wife is not between me and my wife. My marriage with my wife is my wife, Jesus, and me. It's us, God in the center. And it is Jesus, even when the Apostle Paul says, it is not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. I mean, that principle can apply also in the life of our marriage. It is not Milet or me that lives, but Jesus who lives in our marriage. That's what makes it successful. So it's not even about me, it's about Jesus Christ. And I take joy in the fact that I love her. And when I see that I'm giving more, I am happier. That's love. That's what Jesus did. Jesus gave himself for you and for me. He died for us because he loves us that much. Our relationship with our spouse is not something that is between us, but it is, it is our relationship with Jesus. There is the presence of Jesus, and the presence of Jesus is the glue. The presence and life of Jesus is that which binds us together. It's the glue. 
It's that which gives us intimacy and joy and commitment and love. And I emphasize joy. Relationships are meant to be joyful. Enjoy your marriage. Enjoy your wife. Enjoy your husband. Enjoy your children. It should not be all sad and complaining. No, enjoy. Now, when we look at the scriptures, when we look at songs of the parables of the kingdom, there is always the presence of joy. Focus on the joy. The joy that we can have. Focus on that. Marriage is so beautiful. It's a perfect example of what grace is. Because when you get married, and I'm speaking to the young, young ones who have not been married, right? Right now, it's easy to make a commitment. But when your wife smells like Target Balm or Salon Pass, that's real commitment. I'm joking, right? <laughs> um, but my point being is that marriage is a commitment to a person. And the longer you live with that person, the more you begin to see Romans 3.23. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. You know, <laughs> no one is perfect. And the more you get to know, whoa, you know, I didn't know that. But, but you're committed. That's why it's all about grace. When you look at the Bible, I mean, can you tell me one good example of marriage in the Bible? I mean, really good example. Oh, okay, probably you say Ruth and Boaz, but that's just their dating time, you know. There is really no good story. Let me tell you a good parable of a good husband and a good... There's none. I mean, isn't that sad? But I think the good point there is that it is because it is moved. It becomes successful because of grace. It's about grace. It's a perfect example of grace because you live with such a person who is imperfect like you and yet you learn to love that person. Even in all those imperfections. Isn't that God's love for us in the same way? That we are so imperfect. We are so hard-headed and, and all of those negative things. And yet Jesus Christ died for us. He loves us unconditionally. And we are able to exercise that in marriage. Marriage is a good place for us to grow into the maturity of Jesus. It's a place of holiness because of the presence of God and, and His grace. Love. So we thank God for this message. We thank God that He has given us such a beautiful message that we can share to the world. I tell you, the world needs good examples of marriages. So many broken homes today. So many absent dads, missing parents. Sad cases, broken homes. The world hungers for good examples of husband and wife and the church has been given the opportunity to preach the gospel by having a good marriage by being forgiving loving sacrificing by being joyful when people see us they don't hear only complaints but they hear us enjoying life as husband and marriage preaching grace having good marriage so i challenge us to take the challenge to begin to express love more, compliment, and to make sure that we have Jesus Christ in our relationships. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come to you and we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the love that you've given us in Christ. And in Christ, Lord God, there is hope. In Christ, Lord, we have love, intimacy, and joy. In Christ, we are able to express love in patience, in kindness, in giving, in service, and in commitment. A love that never fails. Because that's your love. It is your love that lives in us. Thank you, Lord. I pray blessings on each and everyone here, Lord, that they too, Lord, will let Jesus live in their marriages and in their lives. And we pray it in His name, Jesus. Amen.